Why is business changing and how can we do it better? This is the Leaders of Transformation podcast. And on this show, we interview difference makers and world changers who are disrupting for good. I'm your host, Nicole Jansen, and our guest today is Crystal Parker. I met Crystal a little while ago, and we've had some wonderful conversations around business and leadership and even doing business God's way and why that is a, a good thing, why that's an important thing, why it's very profitable to do business God's way. Crystal is an executive or was a formerly an executive at a Fortune 200 publicly traded oil and gas company. Uh, she has 25 years of experience in organizational management. Uh, she as, actually, as a former college uh, dropout, had the opportunity to advance her career, her education at Harvard Business School and uh, for senior leaders. And she focused on innovation, globalization and leadership diversity. She's also the president of the U.S. and Central Florida Christian Chambers of Commerce. And so she is knee deep in business and talking to business people, has a pulse on what's happening in the world. And I'm just really excited to, to have her here today. We're going to talk about her new book, The Best Robot Wins. We're going to talk about business strategy, leadership, and a lot of really important topics. If you're out there as a leader and in, in, in business in particular, and you're wondering you know, what, like, why are things changing and how can you be on the forefront of that and navigate these uncertain waters, then uh, I think this conversation is going to be really valuable. So Crystal, welcome to the Lead of Transformation. We're glad you're here today. Thank you so much. So excited to be with you today. Well, I was excited that, you know, we've had great conversations around kingdom business, kingdom mindedness, and, uh, and even people that are not necessarily Christians, but that are in business, why just doing business God's way is, is so, uh, like I said, profitable, so important and it just works. It just <laughs> works. And so, um, let, you know, let's start off with just talking about what God has put on your heart and you share with us that as it relates to business and leadership and what you see. Yeah. Well, um, it, you know, it is statistically proven the faith driven CEOs outperform peer industries. And the question is why? And so that's really been something I've been looking to pursue and really try to understand. And just last week, I had a, a real opportunity and a blessed opportunity to go to um, Correct Craft and visit with the CEO, Bill. And Correct Craft is a billion dollar industry company, and they've been in business for 98 years. But there's a story that is attached to the foundation of this company. Their mission is building boats for the glory of God. But the story that just really impressed me and kind of speaks to this point that we're talking about here is that towards the end of World War II, the government had asked them to build boats, 400 boats in 30 days. They had never been able to produce that many boats uh, before ever, especially in that time frame, that short time frame. And so as they were talking about it and praying about it from the leadership team on how to do it, um, they said, we're going to need a miracle to for this to happen. And so they were like, well, and the government was really pushing them to work for every day, 30 days in a row, not take that Sunday Sabbath. And the founder of the company said, you know, if we're going to need a miracle, the only place I know a miracle comes from is from God. And so we're going to hold our Sabbath and we're going to take that Sunday to rest. And so through prayer and an innovative new process that was birthed out of this, they not only met the expectation for the boats, but they were like their, their uh, culture, their faith driven culture was on spotlight because people were calling it a miracle. The companies that were also assigned this, that worked for 30 days, they fell further and further behind and did not meet the needs. So that, I think that's a great example of a paradigm shift of what the world will tell you makes you successful in business. But when you put a biblical worldview on it, not religious, not religious, and this is what I, I really emphasize, biblical worldview on doing business, 
It is something that will transcend all understanding, but also those principles are applicable to business today, which is, I believe, why we see faith-driven CEOs outperform peer industry and peer companies. I love that example. And I, and I, um, it, it makes me think of like Chick-fil-A, yeah. you know, and Chick-fil-A, I don't know if you know the statistics on this, but they are outperforming all of their competitors as well. And they're closed on Sundays. That's right. And, you know, it's, it's so powerful. And I love the, the fact that you're distinguishing between, and maybe talk a little bit for uh, a moment about that, the difference between a religious worldview and a biblical worldview so that our listeners can, can get a context for that. Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, you know, I, I believe that the greatest book ever written on business is not my book, The Best Robot Wins. <laughs> it really is the holy living word of God. It's the Bible. And the Bible, if you read it, you'll realize it isn't about a religion. It's really a principles for living that's taught by the Lord. And in the Bible are basic business principles to how to conduct business. Even when you think about creating a kingdom culture in your business, uh, kingdom culture is a culture that builds trust where people are serving one another. It's not about me, 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 me. And, and there's really an effort to drive a culture in business. And that's really what's helped Correct Craft be very successful. Chick-fil-A too. You look at their onboarding, how they're treating people, the documents and the, the processes and practices that are put in place to help employees be successful, um, to serve the customer. And you turn and you look back at the Bible and you're going to find a lot of similarity there and where they got it. Um, Faith-driven leaders oftentimes are getting an education the rest of the world doesn't get. So when I wrote my book, The Best Robot Wins, what I was trying to really understand was we have better tools for doing business now than ever before, yet we're seeing an accelerated failure in businesses faster than ever. If you look at the Fortune 500 companies, you're seeing a lifespan of about 15 years, where if you look back uh, just 50 years ago, the lifespan was 75 years on a Fortune 5, so Fortune 500 company. So it's like, okay, we've got, you know, personality profiling and we've got Lean Six Sigma and, you know, the ability, there's more data bits than there are grains of sand on the beaches everywhere. And we have all of this data and ways to do business, better ways to plan, lead and organize and control a business, but yet why are businesses failing? And so that was really something that I really sought to understand in, in my book was how can they be failing and what can we do to sort of insulate businesses from um, falling and failing faster than ever before. And I looked, of course, to the Bible and utilized some of the parable, the parable of the seed sower and the parable of talents to really help create um, engagement, communication and simplicity in the business so that you can take your human workers and plug them into an environment where they can be their best self. They can come to business and really thrive. And um, these humans are funny because they have 60,000 thoughts a day. We have 60,000, some people, a few more than others. And uh, when we can take their, the, the brilliance of the human mind and the passion and plug it into a place where they feel like they're valued, they have purpose, meaning, then you're going to be able to take a, a significant competitive advantage over somebody that just says, just bring in the person to do the job. And all we want them to do is push the button, do the job. And you're not inviting them in to an opportunity to collaborate and to be in, a, in, a, in an environment where engagement and empowerment is really rich in that culture. So creating this structure and organization where people can thrive and it's all really based on the Bible. And again, it's not religious. It's just basic principles on how to live your life. So what's an example when you mentioned about the parable of the sower and, and yeah. 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 So um, 
when I was reading through that parable of parable of the seed source, so for people that don't know it, basically it's about a farmer and he's going out to um, plant the seed and some of his seed falls on the dry ground and it just sits there and the birds come and peck up the seed. Some of the seed falls in between the cracks of rocks and what happens is the water can't get to that seed and so therefore it shrivels up and dies. And then some of the seed falls in the thorns and thistles and they choke the seed out. But the seed that the farmer gets to the rich ground produces a hundred times more than um, what he planted. Now in the Bible, when, when Jesus is talking about this, he's talking about the word of God falling on our hearts. But when I read it, because business is my sport and I just have such a heart for business, I really saw a similarity to what happens in the workplace. So let's say that the seed is your human workers and we wanna get those human workers planted in that rich soil. So when the human workers are not engaged and they're sitting on top, like, so you brought somebody into the organization or you've heard the term quiet quitting right now, where these are just employees that are just there for the check and they're not engaged at all. What Best Buy actually did a study and they found that if they could increase employee engagement by 1%, it was equivalent to $100,000 in one single store. So engagement is a, it is not a soft dollar. It is a hard dollar to your organization. It, it, it impacts sick leave, productivity, I mean, morale. So if we could take that seed, if it's sitting on the ground, then to me, that's non-engagement. So that it's easy to be picked away and, and plucked away. The one where the uh, seed fell into the cracks and did not receive the water that water is communication in an organization. Communication in an organization is literally like water getting to that seed. And so in the book, I talk about some communication strategies. Communication oftentimes in organizations is top down. And the bigger the organization it gets, it, it's even harder to find out what the frontline employees are experiencing. And through communication, fluid and flowing communication, it's important that we're, we're teaching our employees to be problem seers and problem solvers. That way, the top line leaders are not spending time creating policy that impacts that frontline worker and the customer that's so uh, not in alignment with what even is helpful for them to do their jobs. And I've seen that happen. The other part of it where the, the parable of the seed sower, where the, the seed is just basically choked out by the thorns and thistles. Well, how I saw that is those thorns and thistles are processes and the things that, that really slow down work from happening in an organization. So our job is to help the organization get to simplicity. When it's easy for someone to come in and do their job and they don't have to do redundant tasks and their job is in alignment with the greater good and mission for the organization. I, I had a, a client that it took three months for a, a vendor to get paid because it had to go through so many processes and just a simple payment to a vendor. Well, that's relationships right there that, that could really be, um, that could really be damaged because of something so simple. And I'm not saying people shouldn't have good processes and systems in their organization, but it certainly should be simple. People don't need to see behind the curtain. Your customers want to turn on the spigot and have water come out. They don't care about the pipeline, the corrosion testing. They don't care about the meter reading. They want water, people. And so your employees also want to be able to do their job and they don't want to have to jump through a, a number of different hoops. And so once we get the seed, which is the human worker planted in that rich soil, and you've created that environment for your employees, then you'll see the ability to yield a hundred times more through productive, passionate human workers in your workplace. So you talk about human workers and your, your book is called the best robot wins. And so it makes you think 
AI and automation and all of that. So talk about the difference and how those two work together. Yeah. So I, um, we're, the statistics say that we're going to see 7 million jobs uh, displaced to AI. Um, Is that U.S. or worldwide? U.S. worldwide. Yes. Okay. And, and what we, what it doesn't, what some people often stop there and they hit the stop button and they're like, oh, you know, we're going to lose all these jobs, but really uh, we're going to see 7.2 million jobs because of this. It's just different. And so what, what happens in organizations is that we have um, leaders that do see training as technical. And I always say hire for personality and train for skill. So what we would want to do in organizations is we want to retain the talent, the top talent. And oftentimes we'll displace employees, really great employees with AI, which I encourage for companies and organizations to do, but retain the talent, reskill them, upskill them. So when I think of talent leaving an organization, it is just this huge hole in the boat. And every time you lose a worker, that is hard dollars that you're losing, especially a good one with a great personality, a good cultural fit. And we're churning and burning people because we haven't skilled them and upskilled them to be prepared for the infusion of AI in our businesses. So business is never going to be without the human worker. So really finding and developing that top talent in your organization and skilling and reskilling and upskilling them. The other part of this that I see as it relates to AI is there's no disaggregate between how we treat the human worker and how we treat those robots. So humans are starting to feel more and more displaced, like they don't matter, like the human element is not even needed. And this isn't anything new. It goes back from the early times in business, where we've all heard, hey, take off your whatever hat and put on your company hat, you know, leave your problems at the door, Nicole, you're coming in here, whitewash it, you know, and yeah. we were really taking away people's ability to truly be human in the workplace. And now that we're seeing an acceleration of AI and robotics, it's happening at an accelerated pace. How many times have you clicked that button that says, I am not a robot? What in the world yeah. do we do? What about I'm a human? Have we ever thought about that before? Little things like that are happening and getting us more and more comfortable with uh, removing the human element in the workplace. Well, when it comes to customer service, if you do happen to have a customer that wants to speak with a human, you want them to have an incredible experience when they do. And we are not preparing the workforce to be able to do that. So there's a, a service element here. And now and now more people are like, do not put me in the IVR. I want to talk to a human being. I want someone to get it. I don't want to be transferred. I don't want to try to figure it out on your silly website. I want a human. And when they want that human, it's really important to be able to truly connect them with a human experience. So we've lost that element in business. And anybody that understands it is able to just crush it in customer service and retention with the workforce. So when you talk about the reskilling of people because AI is going to take. So give us some specific examples. You mentioned about customer service. Certainly there's this hybrid that you're talking about, right? Um, but what are some other areas where you see a lot of that happening or the potential for that happening where AI can replace certain skills that, and think, functions that need to happen? But then these people now maybe even have an example of how that's actually being done well uh, mm -hmm. where people are still retained, the companies are still retaining the talent and just helping them to do some something different. Yeah, uh, I've got a couple of examples just from when I was in the gas company and, and how we would do it. I would see people that would come through the organization that were just phenomenal, sharp, great fit. You, you know, they just stand out. 
And so my way of, of growing and developing them and really upskilling them was, especially as an executive, there were always projects and things that I would be working on that were high level. I never really tried to work in the business. I always told my team, if I get bored, get out of the way because I'm coming in and I'm going to retake some things apart and I'm probably getting in the way. So I always like to stay busy with like big high level projects or different things in the organization. And so that was a beautiful opportunity for me to bring in those those leaders that maybe weren't even in supervisor or manager titles or even director titles, but they were, you know, individual frontline workers that had excellent skill sets that I wanted to develop. So that would be an example of, of some of those. I'd bring them in for projects. They work special projects with me, work one-on-one -on -one with me and get access into different insights and areas of the company. The other thing that I found very helpful and useful is cross-functional development, where you take people and you start to expose their skill set into different facets of the business so that they can bring that intellect and that knowledge into a new facet of the business. And that's another way of development. Sometimes leaders that are transactional think, oh no, well, they aren't producing if they're doing that. But in the long run, what they're doing is creating um, retention efforts because now employees, I mean, especially the younger generations um, have said, very clearly that uh, they want development opportunities. They will leave high paying jobs because there's no development or no uh, upward mobility opportunity. And so you're, it's really a retention effort, but it's also that upskilling and reskilling and um, in cross, I think it's also cross-functional development, but it's also a huge communication tool, getting the left hand to talk to the right hand which is biblical, by the way. I mean, it's, it talks about this in the Bible, how everybody has a different skill set and a different thing that they bring. And in, in, in the Bible, it talks about the body of Christ, but it's the same in the workplace. You've got some people are great at transactions. Some people are great with the people. You have some people that are just genius at their job. And if we can get them all talking and working together, the best robot wins at the end of the day, truly. And talk about that when you say the best robot, you're not talking about the robot that does, <laughs> that's the bot that we're saying, no, we're not the bot. You're talking about the business machine itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see business as a machine. Uh, machines are parts, gears and axles. I mean, that's really what it is. And it's powered by some sort of an energy. Um, business is people, processes and systems powered by money. And I, I heard this quote once I'll share it because it's, Money isn't just the only driver. It, the, the quote was, breathing is to life like profits are to business. Breathing isn't the purpose for living, but it's essential. Just like profits, they're not the purpose the company exists, but they're essential for the business to exist. And so, you know, business being people, processes, and systems powered by something, which is really money, but at the end of the day, it's the greater purpose of why the company exists. So the visual I get when I think about business is when you've, everybody I'm sure listening has heard or seen a, a hamster on a hamster wheel running. Well, let's just pretend you're looking at two hamster wheels. One is in tip top shape and it is running like just as smooth as a whistle. And the other one is dilapidated, broke down, off the track. Which hamster is gonna run faster? the one in the, in, the, in the wheel that works. Well, if you build your business that way so that it is easy for bis people to do business with you and it's easy for your employees to really do their job and do it well, then you're moving at an accelerated rate for your business. So talk about, you were talking about money and it makes me think of stewardship and mm -hmm. the generosity of it too. And you're right. I love that analogy where it's, it, breathing is not the purpose for living, but it is an important function of that. That's brilliant. And so when we think about money and I know I've had business people say to me, the number one priority and goal for business is profit. Hmm. And I would argue that, that it is actually right. value, which is exchanged into, cause that's what money is anyway, right? right. It's, a, it's a medium of exchange of value. And so Talk about how you're seeing even like faith 
led companies use stewardship and generosity and how that even creates this further multiplication. You and I have talked about it, right? This, yeah. this what I call the, you know, generation of uh, the, the, what do I call it? The uh, uh, generosity multiplier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We call it kingdom commerce in the Christian chamber. Uh, yeah, you bet. I mean, corporate social responsibility is sort of the buzzword, if you will, but it's also now, um, statistically proven that people, uh, customers, aren't just doing business with companies that don't have some sort of footprint in that corporate social responsibility um, area, meaning big companies and small companies doing good things in the world. And based off of your mission and your values, your core values could depend on what those what those good things are in the world. Using correct craft as an example, I mean, he's taking his employees on mission trips across in, in other countries and even locally in the cities that they have their, uh, their boat manufacturing. So it's really about, you know, multi, the multiplier effect of, of doing good with your dollars. So there's that, there's that element of business where it shouldn't always just be about profit. There's gotta be something that says I'm a good corporate citizen I'm a good to the community. And oftentimes um, companies are in that element. They do those things because they know it looks good, but they're also blessing a lot of people and a lot of lives through however much they can give. Even they're allowing employees. I know even with One Oak and One Oak was where I came from in the oil and gas company. Um, One Oak was not a Christian based company but they still did good in the world. They allowed us to take a, a paid day to be able to volunteer somewhere. And oftentimes volunteering and nonprofits are doing good and in, in good causes in the world. And so corporate social responsibility is huge. But I think even bigger than that, it's the why are we in business? And as a, as a business consultant and really thinking about business development, the biggest thing is what problem do we solve? Why do we exist? And you're so right, Nicole, companies do not exist to make money. It's, it's a facet. It's something that has to happen to keep doing business. And we, we've seen some of the big ones fall here lately, even headline after headline of these businesses falling because oftentimes they lose the why. And that why has to be at the core of every decision that's made in the organization. You know, why do we do it this way? Well, here's why, because we can better serve our customers, because we can solve the problems. And so really never, uh, never allowing the mission mission to, to creep away from the origination. And, and I do some board training, help people to, uh, improve their board processes and stuff. And one of the things, the very first thing I start with is, all right, let's go around the room. Does everybody know what the mission is here? Because every vote, every decision and everything that you do from a board level to a frontline workers goals, they should all roll into why do we exist? And I think that was one of the biggest challenges I had starting out in the Christian chamber was really understanding the identity of why do we exist? Why should a Christian chamber be in a city? Why would anybody want to be a part of it? And what's the purpose for this? And so once I got really clear on that, and that is with the identity of a human, you want to know why? Why do you exist? I, I don't know. One time I asked a, a young man, you know, what's your purpose? Why do you, why are you here in life? And uh, it was a transformational question for this young man. Um, and so really understanding at the core of who you are, why do I exist? But then the business is no different. Why does the business exist? And uh, really seeing the power and understanding clear identity. Yeah, hundred percent. And when you talk about, let's segue to the Chamber of Commerce, what is the difference between a Christian Chamber of Commerce and a regular chamber of commerce and um and how are you what's your vision around that and how to build that up yeah because i know you took it over what is like two years ago now i think it's three years three ago. years i know wow. it's time to, i think we've wow. been connected now for two years you and yeah. i have 
So, uh, yeah. So I, people ask that question. I hear that question a lot. Like, why, why Christian Chamber? And I think it's helpful just to hear why a couple have started. Um, I we helped with the West Ohio Christian Chamber get launched here recently. And what was going on with, with this group and why he started the Christian chamber there was because, and he had been a longtime member of his chamber of commerce. And I tell people, if you're comfortable in your chamber of commerce, don't leave it. It's not either or it's yes. And in some cases, uh, but for him, you know, the more that he was involved with the chamber, the more that he saw a disalignment in his values. For example, some of the things with the networking and relationship building were done in bars around alcohol, and that wasn't comfortable for him. Um, one day he opened up the directory and was going to update his directory listing, and he was listed next to um, Adam and Eve's sex shop, and that wasn't comfortable for him. He's, and he knew that the money that he was pouring into the chamber was going to help recruit and bring in businesses in his town, in his community that were not in the alignment. He wanted to have a different conversation. He wanted to strengthen people from the inside out in doing business and help people to feel lifted up and really show people another way to do business, like what we've been talking about today. Um, then there's a group out of Jacksonville, the Northeast Florida Christian Chamber, they started because they saw their local chamber of commerce become more and more political and, and supporting candidates that didn't have the same value set. And they knew that by paying their dues, they were helping with that. And we talk about the multiplier with your dollars, right? Kingdom commerce and how when we do business with businesses that maybe have an aligned value set, then we are able to duplicate that dollar. I, I always like to, to remind people, if you've ever donated to an organization and they say, if you give us, we're doing a dollar dollar for match. So if you give us a hundred dollars, we're going to make that hundred dollars into 200. Well, that's how it is when we do business with people that have the same values as us. I know that you're going to sow into and do that good corporate social responsibility and give into kingdom-based businesses. I want to be a part of that. And so my dollar that I pay you for your consulting and your business, I know is doubling down in the kingdom. And so we can really make a big impact in doing that. And we can also be around people that have a like value system to doing business like we do. I never want somebody to feel like they need to go hide in the corner to pray when prayer is a beautiful place to get glean insight and new ideas as way of solving problems. Like we heard with correct craft, when they prayed about it, they held their Sunday. The rest of the world would say, you're crazy. Don't hold Sunday, go burn it up 30 days. And you've got this. And I'm, I, listen, I'm flesh. I've lived that life. I know what that means. I was corporate crystal. I was not the great, greatest person in the world to, to deal with. I knew about God. I didn't have a relationship with God. And so I probably would have told somebody, are you crazy? You're not going to take Sundays off. But now I understand biblical way of doing business. It's different than the rest of the world. And so being able to allow people a place to grow in their faith, advance the kingdom through the marketplace, double down in their dollar is really what a Christian chamber is all about. Well, I love that, you know, that there is this, there's this synergy. And like you said, the duplication and multiplication and, um, and I want to bring up a point here and maybe you can talk about that is diversity and inclusion as well. Cause sometimes people feel like, Oh, it's, we get that a lot. Right. And it's like, Oh, they're all, ex you know, they're exclusive and they're, <laughs> they're, they're, they're wanting to stay in their own little cliques. And that's not actually what you're mm -hmm. talking about. That's so can so you speak good. to that? Yeah. First of all, I've got to hear that word again. Cliques. That's just beautiful. <laughs> I've said clicks, but I'm also from Kansas. I'm a pig farmer. <laughs> That's beautiful. Um, yes. So this isn't an exclusive club. Uh, we're we're nonpartisan, and 
non-religion, non-religious based. It's non-denominational. This is really about an experience on your journey with God. Um, the Christian chamber concept is great to help sort of insulate people in an environment where they can have community and have conversations where people don't think they're crazy. <laughs> but it's really to equip, strengthen, and prepare them as they go into the world and do business and live in the world. And so we know that we're not going to create some big walls around our city, but we also need a place that's a safe place. Um, the other part of this too, I think that's really important is helping people like you see correct craft, helping people understand what it means to accelerate the kingdom through their business. CEOs and, and faith driven CEOs have 840 times more impact with the unchurched than a pastor on Sunday, wow. meaning we're exposed 840 times more to people that are unchurched. So are you prepared for those encounters? And we want to make sure that you are. We want to make sure that people don't think that I'm a Christian company. And so therefore I've got to pray over buddy and do with the Hail Mary and anoint you with the oil. And, you know, and because of what I find is when people do that, it's really freaks people out. And that's not what we're talking about. And so really finding that balance of being able to help people advance the kingdom through their business and through the marketplace, but be prepared to be in the world, to have those experiences that you're talking about. Uh, but just really a, a, a neat place of community. And, uh, and also a great way to get exposure for your brand. Yeah. Yeah. And, and bringing the love of God and, and having people experience God in maybe a, a healthier way than, than they have experienced maybe through religion <laughs> and all of, yes. all of that. So yeah, that is awesome. And I know that you have a big vision even around connecting them and so that people can work and do business together, uh, in, you know, across the country and all of that. But I, I'd love for you to um, just focus in on for a moment. You do uh, expos uh, yes. every year. Yes. I missed it last time. You had Lou Holtz. And I was like, oh, man. Yeah. I, I saw him speak mm, 25 years ago. And okay. I just loved. And I still talk about something that I learned from him, the W-I-N, what's important now. Wow. And, uh, and so, yeah, he, he's, uh, he's an amazing individual. So tell us a little bit about your expo and what, what people yeah. experience there. Yeah. Well, uh, Lou did not disappoint. Let's just say, I mean, he, uh, he hasn't slowed down a bit and he was just as funny and cause I'd seen him before as well. And, and, uh, just that wisdom, just wisdom is what he really gave us. And so that was really neat. But yeah, turning the page on to Expo 2024. It'll be our third Expo and National Conference. And it's U.S. Christian Businesses. And so the title of this Expo is Spiritual World Citizens, Doing Business from the Inside Out. And it's really based on 1 Corinthians 3, the entire chapter, and equipping Christian business leaders to really take an approach of business like they've never experienced before. I really think that we're experiencing acceleration of, of, um, of the kingdom, of a need for leaders to come together from around the world to strengthen one another, but also to be prepared to do business in a different way. And so that's really the heart behind this conference and spiritual world citizen, what is that? It's that we're all humans. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. And when you can understand that, you'll approach life differently, challenges differently, business differently. And that's why I'm just so tuned into that correct craft story of, you know, how they're approaching, how they approached it then and even now in doing business. That's the right way. And our country We've lost that. I talked about quiet quitting before. I think there's a lot of Christians that are quiet quitting on their faith too. Mm -hmm. And so what we want to do is really reignite that and remind people who they are and most importantly, whose they are. 
And so that's really the heart behind this expo. It's in April of 2024. And the uschristianchamber.com, our website, will have all the information. Beautiful. I was just going to ask, where can you find out about that? I love that. And, you know, for myself, having been in business a long time, you know, I, I like you, the corporate crystal, working <laughs> hard, you know how to, you know how to strive. Yes. And so do I. And I think there's a lot of us that we know how to strive, but there's a different way to do this. And there is such an ease and grace yeah. that I find doing business God's way where I can listen and tune in and just do what he's leading me to do. And that tends to, well, not that tends, it always mm. reaps a, a reward, an impact. And I can save myself all this time yes. of all the hustle because yeah. I just need to do that thing. I think about Jesus who said, I just, I'm about my father's business and I just do what the father tells me to do. And it's like, wow, if I were to actually operate that way in business, I could save myself a lot of energy and frustration and money and all of that just to do what he said here, do this, do that sharpshooting. And, you know, as I've told clients and saying, look, God is the best business partner you could ever have. It's he already knows where (laughs) all your new clients are. He knows where all your strategic partners are. He knows who to partner with, who not to partner with also very important. (laughs) Yes. You know, he knows all of that. Yes. And there's such an ease and that's how we can do it in six days and not seven. Cause we can, we just do what he said. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that's so powerful. I love what you're powerful. doing. And uh, every time we talk, I get re-inspired to, you know, that we need to do some more stuff together. So yeah. I look forward to that. And thank you for sharing today. And where can, so you've got the you've got a few websites. So yes. tell us a little bit about what you've got available and where people yeah. can find more about that. Well, people can find me. You can just jump on my LinkedIn, uh, Crystal with the K Parker MBA. I'm in Orlando. So that's pretty easy to find me that way. Uh, my business, my company is called Intent and Impact. And so you can jump on my website, Intent and Impact. You can find out everything. And if you just want to grab my book, you can just jump on Amazon and put in the best robot wins. It's going to pull up probably a Roomba or two, but my book will be in there and uh, you you won't miss it. And then of course, if you want to get plugged into the U.S. Christian Chamber of Commerce, come to the expo in April and and just really experience that life transformation in your business. Just what Nicole said, Nicole, you got me fired up when you were talking because what you said is exactly how we've got to approach business. Otherwise, we're going to, we're going to really be a people that are just at the end of ourselves, at the end of ourselves, tired, broke, disappointed, and in the same rut. And there's a different way. And that's what we've, I'm just so passionate about helping people understand that. And I think probably because it's something I struggle with on a daily basis. I'm like less of me, God, more of you where, you know, the world is screaming at you with this loud voice and it's God's still small voice. And he says, whether I turn to the left or to the right, you will hear my voice saying, this is the way walk in it. And that's the voice we got to learn to listen to and tune into. So, um, yeah, so just, just Google or search me, you'll find me. And, uh, and I'd love to connect with whoever like would like to hear more, know more and connect with me. That is awesome. Thank you, Crystal. I so appreciate it. And uh, I always say leaders of transformation, take action. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to encourage our listeners and our viewers to take action, go check out what uh, Crystal's doing, but just even stop and think there was this, just at the end, we were talking about that still small voice and getting quiet. So Mm -hmm. often people say, what do I need to do more of? And that's the natural worldly way of looking at it. And it's like, well, I would say that the most important question or the more important question would be, what do you need to do less of so that you can hear from God and hear what, you know, he has to say. And uh, his ideas are way better than ours. His plans are way better than ours. So as a leader of transformation, I would encourage you to do that. Um, We'd love to hear your story. So you can go also on our website, leadersoftransformation.com. Of course, all the links to Crystal her, her information uh, to be able to reach out to her is also going to be there as well. Um, but reach out to us and we'd love to hear your stories. We'd like to hear how 
this has impacted you. Um, if there's anything that we can do to support you, we'd love to do that. And we appreciate you being here. And we look forward to seeing you next week on another episode of the Leaders of Transformation. Have a great day. Thank you.